Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Scoob webinar with uh, three of my four of my favorite people in the world. Uh, but I'm going to start with my super favorite person, Alison Abate, and I'm going to. She's been she's produced a lot of things, but we know each other from probably 25 years ago, Alison, or something like that. Yeah, we were, we were both at Warner Brothers. Alison, I think you were working. Uh, well, we're at Disney. You were working on. Runaway Brain, mm -hmm. and we were we were stationed both in London and Paris. Lucky us! So Allison will always have Paris. Now Allison has been producing both traditional animation, CG, and a lot of stop frame over the years. Frank and Weenie, and and then films like that. Um, uh, Wes Anderson's uh, uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox, yeah. lots of other things. But today we're talking about Scoob, and Allison's going to tell you about these other three reprobates. That I'm right now. So, Allison, be my guest. Um, well, thank you. It's really lovely to be here. Thank you for having us. And thank you for allowing us to sort of uh, gush and, and talk about our movie, which we love so much. Um, Tony and I started on this movie, it feels like a million years ago, it was actually 2015. And uh, as with many animated movies, there was many, many, many starts um, and, uh, and iterations. Uh, uh, but this team, really, when this team formed, that's when the movie really got, got kind of really started cooking. Bill Holler, who is our beloved animation supervisor working through real effects, on from the start. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I think is very special, and as we go through the presentation, you'll, you'll hear it, real effects has, was an absolute partner from day one on the film, from when we first started talking about the idea um, and the team at Real Effects ha ha was just like in lockstep, every step of the way, ups, downs, the roller coaster that are all these movies, they were with us. And Bill was sort of uh, leading the charge with that group. He and Tony were like of like mind and, uh, and like really were so in sync the entire time. So that the, because we knew that the animation on this film had to be super special. Um, and so right from the start, uh, those guys were, were like uh, separated at birth. And then when Michael came on, Michael is our production designer and the look of the movie, if you've seen the movie, which I think you guys have, it, it is just so stunning. And so the idea, you know, when we first at Warner Brothers were like, how do we take a television Scooby-Doo serial, like a, you know, mystery and put it up on the big screen. And so, you know, for us, like the, the, the two big, the two big things that we were, were, were important were, you got to make this animation better than you've ever seen it. And we've got to make this movie look as cinematic and spectacular as possible. Um, and these two guys are the guys who helped uh, us do that. And then the North Star of this movie and a person who I could not love more on every level is the director of the movie. And there's really no one on this earth better suited to be telling this, t telling the story of Scooby-Doo and, and, and actually making a cinematic big movie out of it and that is our director Tony Cervoni. He is absolutely the North Star. Every movie needs it. Every movie needs that 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 one person, the expert, the vision, the the expertise and knowledge and that is that's our Tony. So that's my gushy intro to my guys here and um <laughs> really excited for this presentation and I hope you all really enjoy it. Tim, off to you Tony. Should I start it up? Absolutely. Right. Before you start, I just want to let the uh, the Q and A the folks in the in the uh, webinar know, if you have a question, all during the presentation or any time, don't hesitate. Just type it into the Q and A panel. You'll find it there at the bottom of your screen. Hit it. Type in a question. We will field questions all during the uh, presentation and after. So please type them in as they come about. Okay. So get ready to do it. And now. Okay, so what do we this. see? Um, hold on. I need to do share screen. Michael, I think your longer hair is looking pretty good. <laughs> you like it? I do. I know, I like it. And you okay. kept your, your beard. I shaved mine I, off. I'm loving it. I, I, it's great. <laughs> it drove me nuts. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so is everybody seeing? What are you guys seeing? I just need Scoop. to make sure. Okay, um, so we went through, oh, hold on. Yeah, we went through, so there's Allison. So, and, and just, to, just to reiterate, I, you know, I was a producer, but I'm also, I run the division at Warner Brothers, so that's why I have a real pull position of knowing how great everybody is on this team. 
<laughs> and okay. so, to yeah, Tony, you're up. Um, so uh, thanks for watching. We're going to take you through a little bit of a, of a kind of behind the scenes look at the movie. Um, and, you know, I'm, I've worked at Warner Brothers for a long time and have been lucky enough to work both on, uh, have had many jobs on, with the Looney Tunes characters and then many jobs with Scooby-Doo and other Hanna-Barbera characters. Um, I th the difference that between those two things for me is that I, I really got to know a lot of the creators and artists at Hanna-Barbera more than I did, uh, I, had, I had closer more relationships with them. And so I really do feel like uh, this Hanna-Barbera stuff is very special and, um, and is, is, is something that all of us really wanted to kind of t do the right thing and move it from TV to film. So um, we, when we started, we, we went and really started looking at a lot of, gone back to the, the original uh, Scooby-Doo episodes. So we could kind of like reimmerse ourselves um, and, and the first thing that we started with uh, was looking at Iwo Takamoto's designs, the designs for the characters. Most of the characters in this movie were designed by Iwo. Um, and, and Iwo is a, is a person I knew and I learned from and, and, um, and really wanted to find a way to kind of like honor him and um, Kind of take the great work he did, and then and then kind of bring it into this new into this modern three D world. And for for those of you who don't know of who Iwo um, was, you know, like when I first came on the show, that was the first thing I did was read that biography of Iwo, and and it was it's a first it's a pretty amazing read. But the the guy um, he was uh, he was kind of recruited from Disney out of a Japanese internment camp <clears throat> um, because because uh, Disney was aware of the sketching that he did. And he worked under Milk Hall for, I don't know, probably 10 years, maybe even more before going over to, to Hanna-Barbera. And, you know, so, you know, reading his background um, really kind of, you know, added some clout to this amazing design work that he, that he um, took on at Hanna-Barbera. And, uh, and that's important, Milk Hall's important because as we talk, we're gonna find that trying to take what it started as kind of a limited animation television series and try to make a feature film production out of it. Mm -hmm. um, when we needed research and when we needed, um, when we needed more information, we would have to go to other sources. So we would have to go to like, um, and, and we'll talk more about that, but Milk Hall's another source that kind of helped us, uh, helped us, helped guide us. This is the original Scooby-Doo production, uh, the original Scooby-Doo model sheet. Um, and what's great about it, and what's extremely challenging about it is that um, it's a 2D cartoon that was never gonna animate all that much. So it's kind, Scooby-Doo in these drawings, and I love them, this isn't a criticism, is a, is, kind of a different dog in every single view. You know, his three quarter to his, to his profile, to his front on view, Iwo just drew what looked good. But we had to take this and make it uh, into a 3D object that can actually move. So that this was a big challenge, but that's why it's like, take a look at, at these drawings and how uh, kind of abstract they are and, and how um, representational they are. Like, they're beautiful drawings, but they don't exactly translate to 3D. And I, a story I've told a million, a million times is uh, one of an animator from Hanna Barbera told me years ago that Scooby was always really challenging to animate because of this. Be and and they used to say like the they used to make fun of the in betweens on the old shows because they they never looked really great. So he would say like between the key positions, like if, if, the, if the first drawing is a key, then you start, it's Scooby-Doo, it's a boot, it's a kitchen sink, it's a chicken, and then it's Scooby-Doo. Because as you got away from, farther away from the keys, the weirder everything looked. Um, 
And then when we found when we made this movie, it, it stayed absolutely true in 3D. And so we'll, we'll talk more about that. This here is actually uh, the very first drawing of Scooby we did for the movie Scoob. Um, and it was uh, Sandro Cloizo drew it for us. And um, at the very beginning, we started very close to, to an original Scooby-Doo. Um, so this was actually the first drawing. And this is of mm -hmm. that group, one of the very first drawings. At, and this here is uh, when we did our very first presentation to the studio for the movie. This was the very first painting of Scooby-Doo. So you could kind of see kind of how, how traditional it's, we started. Um, and then Bill, I'll, you know, jump in. But what, what, we start, what we went from there was, hey, this is a feature animated movie that's gonna be, um, you know, that's gonna have like different, very different demands than the original, des than the original designs had. So it kind of led us to what, how does a real dog work? Like what, mm -hmm. what is really happening here? So, um, so we, you, you guys brought a, a real great date into real effects. I mean, so much of this movie is about caricaturizing um, real life things. And, and you can even see it in Ewo's work, um, which we'll talk about later, but, but we really wanted to see how, how a real Great Dane walks, how, you know, the, the things that are special about the, that dog and, you know, how, how much of a big dog they are. There's so many shots in the originals of Scooby jumping into Shaggy's arms and we knew we'd do it in this movie. So just being able to see how, how heavy, how large these, these type of dogs are was important for us in animation. And it's absolutely true. It's kind of a cliche, but it is absolutely true. You, you need to know how something works before you could caricature it. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, here, this drawing was done by Bryn Matheny. Um, and so as we started designing Scooby as a 3D object, we really went in and started to go, how much of a real dog should Scooby have? Like, if this is a 3D Scooby, what are the demands of a 3D Scooby versus a 2D? Scooby and where would his how does his skeleton work and where would his muscles be and and so there was a long process where we we did all these kind of orthographic drawings and really try to figure out how a Scooby Doo would work mm -hmm. um, and so and at this point too early on we just we were really exploring how much real dog should be in Scooby Doo yeah at this point he was he was leaning a little bit more towards what a real dog. Yeah, and one of the reasons why was um, that Ewo, on the original Scooby-Doo live action movie, um, that which direct, Raja Gosnell directed, I was talking to them a little bit about, about how to design 3D Scooby back then, just at the very beginning. And I said, and, and it was happening in the animation building, and I said, well, Ewo's upstairs. Why don't we just get Ewo and, and ask him what to do? So I, I, I went upstairs, I went to UL's office. I said, do you have a minute where this is what we're doing? He said, sure, he came down and he looked at all this, listened to us and looked at some of the design work that had been done. And his response was, well, is uh, Shaggy gonna be a cartoon character or a CG Shaggy? And we were like, no, it's an actor. What about the other ones? And I'm like, no, no, it's all actors. And he said, well, then why is Scooby-Doo gonna be a, a uh, animated dog. Just go get a real Great Dane and and have them talk like uh, like like Babe. And then he got up and left. And that was like that was his <laughs> that was his advice on how to create a three D Scooby. Was Scooby's a Great Dane? If you're going to make a live action movie, he should just be a Great Dane. Um, so there was a little bit of well, how where are we going to go? How are we going to make something that raises the bar over stuff we've seen on TV? Um, but still stays true to the character. So all these poses are very traditional poses of Scooby, but- These are from the original, these are just re rethinking of the original model sheet poses. It, it is, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this, obviously this isn't where we landed in the film, but it was, a, it was just part of the process that we kind of had to go through just to explore. Yeah, and it was a long process and yeah. everything was valuable. I mean, that's one of the reasons, that's really one of the things we want to stress is that we learned a lot by doing these things. Um, and all of them were necessary 
to kind of make a, a, a cartoon dog at the end of the day. So Tony, uh, and guys, when, when you were doing this, was there ever any discussion about taking the 3D models, modeling used in the live action shows and just kind of adapting it and kind of going from that? Or was it like, nope? No, well, it's because the technology had changed so much since mm -hmm. the live action movie. We knew we were going to start again from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we didn't really think of starting there. We kind of went back to the original, the, the original model sheet, then a real dog, and then go, mm -hmm. where, is, where do we really want to land? Right. And the interesting thing about these model sheets that Bryn did, those are those are the same as the original 1969 model sheet poses. It's just an interpretation using a more realistic dog. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, we 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 still were trying to stay true to the original content, but you know, how can we? Right. Is this is this a good way to one up it? I guess. And I think this is one of the very first 3D models. Of, yeah, that, that might be the, yeah. the very first one. Which, and weirdly, Frank doesn't look that different from the live action Scooby. You know, it looks kind of like a little bit more of a refined version of the character that was in, in the live action movie. Yeah. yeah, and if you showed this to anybody in the United States and said, who is this? If you took the collar off or something, like, or just hid the SD on the, they, they'd know it was Scooby Doo. Well, that, yeah. that, that's the deal. That's what that was going to be my next follow up is, yeah, it's Scooby Doo. You know, that's, it's not, it's not Astro. Yeah. <laughs> Although maybe it would, if he's gray like that, it could be Astro. Yeah, he's almost Astro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there is that growth from, it was Snuffles. Yeah. Then it was Muttley. Yeah. Then it was Astro. All, all Takamoto's. Uh, yeah. And then there was a character named Mumbly. Oh, yeah, Mumbly. Yeah. Uh, right. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Mumbly in, I can't remember in what, but in something. He Level. had his own show. It was called like the Mumbly Hour. Yeah. Or something like that, I remember. Uh, so, uh, so this kind of brings us to one, as we're developing the look of the character, we're also really developing the animation style and, and where we went to for that. Yeah, this, this was the very first, like taking that, that model that you just saw and trying to pose it in just a Scooby-Doo type of pose in, in an environment that he might be and just try to capture the spirit of it. So this was, this was kind of the very first, you know, with a really yeah. rough rig animation. Very first thing that moved. Yeah. But if you, if you see that, you know, like that, um, you know, that the lit version, you know, that's the very first groom, very first kind of, kind of moving this odd, moving, forcing Scooby to, to, to go into 3D. Yeah. It was funny too, like when I was, I was talking about this the other day, like with, um, when, when I first did this pose in the little animation test, the very first time, you know, there is that little level of starstruck, you know, like, oh, I'm working on Scooby-Doo. MK, I don't know if you had a little bit of that too. Oh, totally. Because you know, yeah. this, this is a character that, I, that got me wanting to be an animator, you know? So here I am actually animating it. Um, but then quickly it was like, wait a minute. I gotta really put, like, forget about starstruck. I, there's, a, there's a responsibility to get this right. <laughs> so it kind of turned into, into, into more of that. <laughs> Well, and then, and it, then it became an obsession. That watching that <laughs> test, just that small test, shows that like when you take an anatomical model like that one when we saw the spin on it, yes, we all agreed that you could call that Scooby-Doo, but it was more dog-like. But when you put it in the hands of someone like Bill, then all of a sudden the life that is Scooby-Doo, even with that model with the musculature and everything like that, it, it felt more like Scooby than just the frozen model did, if you know what I mean. Like there was a life that you, and that's that respect that you, you did your homework and took that model and pushed it as much to being Scooby-Doo as you could and, and, and it shows. And that's, and real, that's really important. And as we continue to talk about how now uh, we were animating these models and, and how this led to the development of the characters, um, it is a combination of design and utility. You know, it is a combination of 
what do we need and what what looks great and what do we need and how those two things work back and forth because you might have a still image that looks really awesome and then the second you start moving it you go oh yeah. now we need this and that and the other thing and then and then and then you do that and then you move it a different way and then all of a sudden you got to change it again so these two things really work back and forth or they should work back and forth um and and i feel like the more you do that, the more the character speaks to you. And, and, and really that's part of it too. List, you almost have to listen to the character as mm -hmm. you're creating it. Yeah. So at the very beginning, you know, Tony and I looked at a lot of um, inspirational work. You know, we looked at Lady and the Tramp and we're looking at how more realistic jowls and things are working and, and um, a bunch of things. Uh, but one interest, interesting thing, Tony told me, Early, pretty early on, everything that I, I need to know about Scooby-Doo is kind of in this first episode, season one, episode one, all the cycles are in there, all the things you're going to really want to capture with Scooby are, are there because this is when, when it was established. So we kind of went there and... Uh, yeah, we and, thought we'd have to like go through the whole first couple yeah. seasons and pan, and pan, and it's like, nope, every walk cycle, every run cycle, every scamper, every skid. Mm -hmm. Every every jump in the, into the arms, like every bit of animation that exists in Scooby Doo, is in the first episode. And it's not that much. I was surprised. Like this, the amount of cycles was just a few. And it's like this is what's defined him for fifty years. You know, you know, back in those days when they were going to do a show, a lot of attention was paid to what they could reuse and reuse. Yeah, and reuse. yeah. How did they get the shows done? So there you go. And every, I mean, they reuse this stuff for years, <laughs> you know, like years and years. And, you know, so one of the first things we did, we took a lot of these cycles and we just tried to emulate them with the 3D model and see what, what this looks like in 3D. It, you know, and, and we did things where we just pretty much copied straight from the, the keys that were done before. And you can see like in some of these tests, how weird it looks in different angles, just because you're not used to seeing it mm -hmm. moving in 3D from that angle. Or if the camera rotates around something, something that may have looked okay in a, you know, in an eight drawing 2D cycle looks really weird in 3D. So the more we, we move things around, you can see kind of the style of the characters, um, it starts to change too. The more we realize that we couldn't be literal. We couldn't go, this is literally the same walk cycle, mm -hmm. this is literally the same run cycle. We couldn't be literal about it. We had to achieve what, what's going on in the audience's brain, what you think that walk cycle really looked like and, and what, you, what you thought. It, it's more about going for the feeling of it rather than the actual execution of it. So everything that started guiding us once we started moving things was what feels right versus mm -hmm. kind of what is right and how do we get to something that feels right which was looking at other sources and other sources that um that some of these same people worked on that that was kind of a big thing too like when, when I, I i was looking through the credits for all the scooby-doo and kind of looked up every animator and looked up their history and this was a this was not a hack crew that was working on this. This was like the Tom and Jerry crew. I mean, I mean, you had like Lloyd Vaughn in there and Ed Love and, and Irv Spence, I know worked on, on these too. And, and uh, so like a lot of times as we're doing, going through the animation, I was, I was always asking myself, okay, if Irv Spence was animating this scene, he's not on a limited budget now, what would he do with this? Right. Yeah. So that led us back to Tom and Jerry because mm -hmm. A like a lot of these people, when they had time and money, were able. This is this is more of their fuller animation style. So we went back to studying a lot of Tom and Jerry because there's a lot of similarity there. It's all the same people, mm -hmm. many of the same people. Well, it seems you, you can even see in these scampers and in these um, skids and stuff how Irv Spency they are. You know, like yeah. It, it, Every frame counts. You guys are approaching, you're approaching this. I keep listening to what you're saying. You guys are all familiar with traditional animation. You know what the limitations and what the strengths of that are. 
And it seems to me like what you were trying to do, maybe I'm reading something into this, is take the foundations of traditional and, try, and, and infusing them into CG. So Scooby is not the traditional CG dog. No, and very, I mean, very much so. And every character, there's so many different conflicting animation styles in this one movie yeah. that we did on purpose. Um, and we were very aware of as we were doing it. But, but Sco Scooby and Shaggy in particular are very much based on this 1940s 2D style of animation. And when, like this is a more realistic Great Dane run for Scooby, but that looks like, that goofy windmill run is the, looks like Scooby-Doo. Mm -hmm. like the natural run could be any dog. This can only be Scooby-Doo. Right. So, and now you can see of, of these things like where Tom and Jerry is starting to influence our animation. And as we kind of got more and more and more into going, oh, oh, this feels like Scooby, um, then it's, uh, it really started guiding the design to for Scooby to just be pushed more and more and more to his original yeah. state. I just want to make a quick note. We are getting some questions in. And as they, as you guys are talking and it becomes apparent that the question works with what, uh, with what you're talking about, I will, I will. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. totally. Cool. Yeah. So now you can see where Scooby's going now and, uh, and, and how we're kind of going back to these model sheets as Scooby's evolving a little bit more to 1969. And, and this was kind of posing that the more realistic dog model into these model sheet poses. We had two of them. We had the 1969 version, and then Sandro did great interpretations of the more realistic dog in those poses. But as we posed it, we just weren't getting out of the model. So I, I spent a lot of time just drawing over top of the model of what I wanted to do and um, it was apparent we needed to make some changes. And, and, and that even the original Scooby drawings, those original 69 drawings, there is, ab there is an abstract form of real dog anatomy. Mm, in yeah. So also, because now where you know so much about what's going on inside a dog, we were able to like look at the original Scooby and go, oh wait, that's what, there, there's a bone in there that that's not just yeah. a weird shape. Yeah, that's, there's an actual bone in there that's doing that. Like, the, Bill, yeah, Bill, tell that story about your. Yeah, the, the thing like like one thing that, that kind of tripped me up with Ewa's drawing, like the knee, like he's got this really large elongated elongated knee in the back hind legs. And you can kind of see it in this in one of this model sheet here. And I was like, what what is that? Is that just Ewa just being abstract here or is that anything? And I started looking at real dogs and I, and I took my dog and I just started feeling the leg, the back leg and how it works. And I was like, wait a minute, I feel two apexes here. I feel like, like there's a, an elongated knee or kneecap or something. And then went back to anatomy and looked at the way the bones go. And sure enough, there is a suggestion of either a giant kneecap or two bones that are pressing two peaks. And Ewa was really only just caricaturizing what was going on in real life. You could and remember, it. and again, like what we said about Ewo's training, that is spending 10 years with Milk Hall. Yeah. If I wouldn't have known that, then I would have been like, eh, I don't know about this. But I knew that there were some legitimacies here. Oh, yeah. And then the paws, yeah, that, too. That, this is like the evolution of Scooby's paw, because uh, like other things, the front paws, we started um, with a much more realistic uh, a, a realistic dog and then dogs have that dew claw so we yeah. were like can we force that dew claw into being a thumb but it, it always looked <laughs> kind of weird um so we just kept pushing it and pushing it and changing it until it just became a thumb yeah so we, but when scooby's walking on all fours and we use this paw it looked weird it looked like he was walking on his hands yeah <laughs> so we actually had two sets of hands when scooby has to pick something up he uses this hand, and then when he walks, he goes to a he goes to just a four fingered paw. You know, and at some point, we just eliminated the dew claw. Yeah, the, and the, just the, we were like, well, why don't we just make one of the digits his thumb? And that's yeah. that's what we yeah we we did we There's ended up landing on. You know, the old Warner Brothers characters like Bugs Bunny or anything with the gloved three fingered 
yeah. um, except when they needed the extra finger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like I know. You know, then suddenly, you know, told Trigger or in the uh, in um, uh, the Rossini one where he's massaging Elmer's head. Yeah. At least not, you know, the next thing. <laughs> and some things, uh, some things look extra weird in 3D, you know, like, like, uh, and this pod looked really weird. Like, the, looking at this as a 3D object, just, oh, yeah. it, it looked like a monster hand. Well, like, yeah, if uh, you go back a couple of frames there, you could see, like, what, what it really looked like before we even drew over it. Yeah, that, that's, that's a that's thumbs not, up. That's not a pretty thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Allison, yeah. When uh, when Tony would come in your office or at home at night, would he be uh, would he obsess over what do we do with the dew claw, or was he like? No, it was it was pretty. Uh, to me, this was the fun part of the exploration was really cracking the code of translating from two D to three D. So. I would say this was one of the most joyful elements. Of, uh, <laughs> well, then I'm going to wait and ask you about the unjoyful ones later. On. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is the fun part. This is like cracking the code. The the face was a big part of cracking the code too, because um, here here's where we were starting to, to pose facial expressions, and we really had to figure out what's what's on model, what's the important things of of Iwo's drawings in the face that we absolutely need to get in, in, our, in our model. And, and, uh, and, and again, some things that don't make any sense in 3D, like just don't make sense, but need to be there. Like that little smile line, that little like exaggerated T-shaped smile line with the little bump over it. Mm -hmm. that, is an, that seems like it's something that takes no thought to draw and is like shorthand for a smile in 2D but introduces 3D problems like you can't believe. Like, so yeah. making that smile line was, it drove our riggers nuts, drove everyone nuts. It's, it's funny, Tony, this was done a long time ago and now I, ha I, I have additional notes on this now. I know. <laughs> no, no. I know. The dinosaur. Oh, that, don't, <laughs> don't get me going because everything I see I'd love to change. There, uh, unfortunately, a little bit of Gertie the dinosaur crept into our Scooby-Doo model that we were always trying to get out. It was literally the last note, animation note I gave on the show. Yeah. <laughs> dinosaur Bob. Gertie the dinosaur, huh? It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bipedal Scooby, yes. Th this was something that unfortunately came up pretty late in the, in the development, but it was it, it, so glad it did. So, we, you know, we have a quad model, but we knew that he's probably gonna have to do some bipedal type things. So we went back to the very first, again, back to the first season, episode one, episode two. And I pulled out every bipedal thing that Scooby did that we would need a, a bipedal model. And I was surprised, it was about a third of the time he's doing bipedal things. And I was like, well, certainly if, if he's doing it here, Tony is definitely going to ask and, for this And stuff. I'll be honest, I, that number surprised me because I never thought he did bipedal things 30% of the time. I know for sure Joe Barbera never liked when he got kind of got up on his back legs and, and never, and, um, and, and, uh, and became more human and less dog like that was always like a, a thing that drove Mr. B nuts. So I was like, yeah, we're not going to do it too much. And then, and then when we got in it, I was wrong. We I wanted to do it as much as anyone ever did. So the one thing we, we since we were late in development, we kind of had to prove that we needed to, to to create an additional model. So Tony did some drawovers of what bipedal needs to look like, um, which was super helpful. And then um, we did an animation test, uh, which I don't I don't know if that's in here. But we did an animation test just to have him do a bipedal type of thing and see what it would take if we tried to force the quad model into it. And it was just so much sculpting every frame that. Yeah. So we off. wound up with, there are two Scooby models in the movie. There's bipedal Scooby, quad Scooby, um, and then two sets of hand, two sets of front paws, hands and paws. Mm -hmm. um, and then this kind of got us up to the point, uh, you could see where Scooby kind of got to, like 
that last Scooby you just saw is pretty Scooby. You know, this is not a world away structurally from where, where we ended up in the movie. Um, but we got Scooby to about this point. And then we'll go through kind of the Shaggy story because kind of had a similar story and how that affected Shaggy as well. So there, there's Shaggy's original uh, 1969 model. Um, that is the very first drawing we did a Shaggy for the movie. Uh, again, done by Sandro. <coughs> um, and a, another one from that batch. But you could still, you could see there's, there's still, there's, there's Shaggy in there. Um, but there was more, there was some searching to find out what 3D Shaggy looks like. Um, and also like, the, I think we had, we had to, we had to explore we had to go, what, let's do different Shaggies and see if we like it. Just like we did that first dog that had a lot of anatomy in it. We had a Shaggy that was really different. Uh, Devin, Katie Lee drew these. And I like, like, I like these drawings and I like these characters, um, these designs very much. But, but it was like, is he Shaggy enough? Like, is this the movie we want to make? Is this you have to do this exploration because um, there's some things in all of this that we kept and that did affect the final Shaggy. But, and just like uh, Michael said before, I think people would recognize this as Shaggy, but was this the Shaggy we wanted in the movie, you know? And so as we started animating him and sculpting him and creating him as an, as an object, the same thing that happened to Scooby started happening to Shaggy. You can see the notes here are starting to like get push it a little bit more, a little bit more towards um, towards the original design. Like and we stay we stayed here for a while. We yeah, were we were really like, trying to make this yeah. guy our Shaggy. Yeah, we were trying to make this work, but then it just the more we did it, the more it didn't want it. It was telling us, "Don't do this," you know. Kind of glad it was, guys. <laughs> well, yeah, That's even funny. in Tony yeah. Strover, like yeah. he has the original model sheet in yeah. there. Yeah, at some point, then it's like, here, look at the model sheet. Look at the model. Now, like, we're literally saying, look at the model sheet. <laughs> yeah. so, um, it just, and this, we're doing like the, the Reader's Digest version of this, which is a reference no one knows anymore. But um, <laughs> uh, this took years. You know, we're talking about some a, a process that may have been like, Two, three, two years, a good two years. Mm -hmm. And you got really far with it. Like, look yeah, at this. Yeah. Thing. yeah. So this is an, an animation test that we did um, where Scooby had pulled a little bit ahead of Shaggy, it, meaning that he started to look a little bit more like classic Scooby, but Shaggy was still looking a little like this different Shaggy. And when we put the two of them together, um, it just started to seem like, well, who's that guy with Scooby-Doo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sure did. So, so again, how one thing affects the other, and this isn't a, an, an organic process, and when one domino falls, it pushes something else down. Um, but this was a very first kind of look of picture um, idea, like where we could really kind of get into the style of the characters and the style of the lighting um, and, and this, when we had done this, this was as advanced and as far along as we could go. So uh, we wound up, that's, this is that Shaggy from that test, um, which I think there's a lot of things I, that I think is really cool about him, but is he just, is he Shaggy? He just didn't seem Shaggy enough. Mm -hmm. um, so we kept working on it and we got Shaggy pretty quickly from that to this, which is, a lot more straight up classic Shaggy. And at this point, this is when Michael Korinsky joined the, yeah. joined the, and then also going back to original Shaggy poses, taking this mod, this, this kind of closer to the original Shaggy and putting them into uh, predicaments that the original Shaggy was in. Same thing with expressions and going, okay, we're feeling really comfortable with this guy. This guy's turning the corner. And it was amazing too. Once we got him this model, he just he came together pretty fast. Like the, it was it was yeah. so much easier because yeah. we knew how we needed to animate him. Yeah. Once the model. We, 
Once we got Scooby and Shaggy in the same kind of condition, we knew where we were at and we got yeah. much more comfortable. But it was a long time, a long yeah, time. Yeah, I missed that process, but. Yeah. <laughs> But in some ways, that's perfect wow. you missed that process. Yeah. You know, when you showed up, you're like, oh, OK, I see what you're trying to do. How can we do even more? Yeah. 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 Nice. And uh, take it into the next level. So, so um, what I did when I came in first, I saw all that stuff pretty much like what you guys just watched was like my first day uh, on the job. Tony showed me everything, the whole evolution in one day, and he said, we can keep what you want. We can get rid of what you want. Let's talk about it. And we kept a couple of things that still made it into the movie almost exactly. But then everything else we we got rid of. And then the Shaggy and Scooby characters, We I said, I think we can go even further. But what, I'm going to take one step back with like talk about some stuff. Um, when I when I think about designing first, like the, I'm a big colorist. So color is a big thing with me. And so... I put together this now when we did when we've done this talk before it was with a live audience and it was really fun to have everybody yell out so let's see how fast you guys can type we're going to play a quick game here and you guys can tell me because i don't have the chat up because i'm running the show but tell me how fast they get these um these examples of just with color swatches can you tell who is it so ready who is it how fast did they get it I took this test, by the way, Michael, and I got yeah. pretty far through it. Okay, so I'm sure you guys, this one's easy because I actually did size relationships with it. It's The Simpsons. Okay, ready? Who is it? Can you guys see on chat? Did they get it? I think they could see it. We, 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 okay. they, they're going to have to use the Q&A, but that's okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, no, no problem. Oh, okay. It, there was no um, measurable amount of time. Every time we did this live, there was no stopwatch that could get how fast when, from when slide went up to the reaction. That's how good you animation people are. So obviously this is the Flintstones, only just with color bars. Now we get a little harder. So who is this one? This is the Super Friends, just broken down into color swatches. And then this one, a little harder, but pretty quickly people got, this is Looney Tunes. And that brings us to, who is this? Breaking down the Scooby-Doo gang just into their simplest colors, you know exactly who they are. And um, I did my homework with these colors and everything like that. And there was very, they were really smart people who put together this palette for this gang. And there's a whole psychology even in some of these colors that they used for these characters like I'll be really quick but it's like Fred primary colors the the basis for colors Fred is the rock the base and his compliments are are Daphne the the comp uh, she is secondary or tertiary colors which are a great compliment and we know Fred and Daphne went together uh, um, analogous colors for Velma earth colors for Shaggy because he's our earthy guy and Scooby-Doo, well, kind of classic colors for him, good complement colors. Um, so if you would have gotten that, you would have won Scooby Snacks. Uh, you would have won Scooby Snacks. And yeah, so I would have, we would have thrown these at <laughs> We would have bought your love. We would have thrown food at you. Um, so that's what we would have done if, if we were live. So sorry, we can't feed you today. But snacks. the whole point of playing that game was that just as much as the shapes, and we just showed you how much that evolution of the shapes of Shaggy and Scooby went through before I even got on here, the color is equally as important to the design of these characters for instant recognition. And if you don't believe me, who is this? You could take those original drawings and you put these colors on them and it's like these cease to be the gang anymore. So I knew that it's like we could play around with design to a degree, especially in costuming, as long as we adhered to this palette and the amount that those colors were used on these characters and we'll still recognize them as our gang. So here's some of the changes. And, and what I first did when I got in, in uh, onto the show was I consulted the big book of all things Scooby-Doo. And basically this book is just like everything you want to know about how to post Scooby, what colors make up Scooby and the gang. Um, 
And this is what the big book of Scooby-Doo said were, was the palette and the flat colors for every one of the gang. But flat colors are just one color and we're making a three dimensional object at minimum, you have to have the mid-tone, the highlights and the shadows and there's a whole lot more that can make the colors go wrong. So this was the dog that, that when I came in, this was that model. And the first thing that I noticed was, without even looking at the big book of Scooby-Doo, was like, he feels way too chocolatey to me. And when I, I confirmed my suspicions by looking at the swatch and putting it on here, and just with some quick Photoshopery, um, was able to get Scooby's color closer to the, the Pantone color. And then I started even doing some painting on the fur. If you can see, look at his chest. There was sort of this reverse fur thing going on with his chest and this model still has the dew claw on it and yeah this this yeah th this uh at this point um scooby's groom also was very much like a like a dog was very much like a realistic dog and that's that's why that hair changed direction on his chest like that is because that's what dog's hair does um but then when michael came on board he's teased so it was like we don't need that, and I we all agree. So we simplified that. Well, the, we had a question. We had a question coming in at, uh, about that actually from Mark Walton, um, cool. and he said uh, the difference in a simple flat uh, render instead of seeing every every hair, mole, wrinkle is a difference between something appealing and something not appealing because you get mm -hmm. lost in the in the wrinkle or something like that. So the idea that you had these extra details that you Right, and then starting to lose those extra details because that's absolutely right. Like you just start going, we don't need that. It's just distracting. It's something that's pulling your eye away from what you want your audience to be looking at. Um, so, so simplifying that was, you know, really the that's the right thing to do. Yeah, simplifying the eyes, getting rid of like too much texture in the eyes. So we started making those changes and then um, we posed this model and I kept doing paint overs of the model and seeing how far we could just keep pushing it. So the model became this, getting even closer. And you can see, I just feel like it, as a design thing, you can see how that reverse hair thing just added an element like it's, it's I'm, less is more, you know, like less is more with Scooby-Doo. And you don't feel like you're losing anything with him. He feels volumetric, he feels three-dimensional, but you don't need all that extra stuff in here. So this becomes this. Also playing with the highlights, not letting his shine get too white was another thing that was killing his color. And also on these things too, we're doing little draw overs, like that smile line that I mentioned before, like we're still working on it here. In fact, yeah. we worked on it every day of this movie so yeah, pretty much <laughs> you know like but you could see ref, tiny refinements happening in the in the structure as well bill go big... look at gertie the dinosaur it'll be okay <laughs> <laughs> and a big thing with the color too that uh, uh, if you watch the movie what i always tried to tell the lighters was use lights on these characters that don't um, absorb or take away or kill the color too much because the one thing just like Frank how you said um, we were coming from a 2d sensibility I mean I started as a background painter where you know I never painted the characters the characters always were that extra element that popped off of my, the backgrounds I painted I want to and Scooby-Doo was the same way that those characters colors never changed if they were outside and it was blue they didn't blue down you know fred's white shirt it was always those colors i didn't want to go obviously that you know put white light on our characters all the time but i always tried to find a way to keep the colors clean is the word i used so that you never forgot that it was scooby's brown or shaggy's green shirt and that was really important i think to getting them to look like it so but back to scooby this was that model after all those changes you can see the dew claw is gone now. The groom is cleaner. And yeah, this is Scooby from the movie. This is yeah. this is the final, like the neutral position of the final model. And like I said earlier, when you put it in the hands of someone talented like Bill, and they give it life, you go from this sort of zombie Scooby to this guy. And it's like, there is no doubt who that is. 
you know, and we see that model that we said we shot we showed earlier that we would say like 95% of America would look at this and go that's Scooby Doo. This is really Scooby Doo. There's so much it shows how much further you can always go and push, push, push. And I kind of felt like that was my role when I came in. I was like, let's just see how far we can go and push it. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing with Shaggy. When I walked in, I was so happy with this model. I was like, oh my gosh, that is such a great 3D representation of Shaggy. Where I don't really need to do a whole lot to his face. His beard looked really good. So I started playing with his hair because to me, that's like his namesake. He's Shaggy because I think his hair is all Shaggy. And then, um, uh, so this was a paint over. And then we actually started doing the groom. And it was funny, like when we had that first groom, if you look in the upper left one, it's like, that Shaggy just come from the barber and getting way too much taken <laughs> off the top. He's not happy about that. He would wear a hat that whole time. You mean Michael the Hannah bar Barber? The Hannah Barber. Uh, Ooh, good. good one, Frank. That one. Um, <laughs> Tony was really big on like, he really wanted those silhouettes of the hair to have that clumpiness, really feeling not just the positive shapes, but the negative shapes cutting into them. And I think it really added something when we got that clumping if you look at the bottom right, the, the, the shape variety and the clump variety, some thin triangular shapes, some thicker ones, it really started to feel like um, a 3D interpretation of that 2D groom that we, we knew so well. Uh, another place we talked about playing with was costuming. And again, I was cool with that, said, uh, well, let's explore as long as we keep the ratio of the same green, the same amount of green, we don't put him in a red t-shirt. I know there was one series, he had a red t-shirt and I, that, that was too weird for me. Uh, I was like, he's always got the green t-shirt, but we said V-neck or no V-neck, uh, decal or no decal, ringer tee possibly. You can also see he's wearing sneakers here too, which was different. He wore boots in the original. Um, and we got to this guy, I, or, or, or this guy was a, a long sleeve baseball tee. That was one we tried. But then I think this, this is where we landed. And really the, only, the biggest change on here is that we put a gray Henley underneath the, the, the t-shirt. And I, I think it was because Tony said, do you realize the rest of the gang is dressed for winter? Yeah. Like Velma's always in this giant sweater and Fred's got like three layers on, it looks like, you know? It's like, you know, so we got them closer together, I think, just for the seasons. Um, and it is a little then, nod to the live action uh, yeah. Shaggy 2 who wore that thermal under. It, I think it was a great addition to make yeah. it. To, yeah, make it, it, fit, it really fits the character. And, and, so, and so agreed, uh, uh, Jamie Mizrahi, who is uh, um, a, uh, a stylist and a, a live action costume designer. She's like sort of the stylist to the stars. We had her come in and take a pass over this and I thought I found it really helpful mostly for like the materials um, she brought in swatches and found different references and she was the one that said booth you got to go back to the boots and we were yeah. like okay so just, uh, just to interject here like it is this yeah. was definitely a note like a studio note that we needed to contemporize their costumes and we needed to get someone who is cutting edge stylist to like Katy Perry stylist like just and she came back and went, why are you changing it? They should look like they should look. He should wear boots. And, you know, going back to a, a more contemporary, and we'll take you through the gang, but it was great and really helped us to kind of know we were on the right track because even when we brought in the coolest person we had ever met, uh, she was like, go back to the original, go back to what's, what's authentic about these characters. And so, it, so this it was, is where we landed. Yeah, so this was after her final input this was the Shaggy that we ended up with. And again, when you put him in the hands of a really great uh, animator and he's Pose, uh, it, we, it's just Shaggy that we know and love. I mean, it's, it's him 100%. And this is the two of them together with the unofficial uh, mm -hmm. sixth member of the Mystery, of Mystery Inc., the, uh, the Mystery Machine, which I, I, I love. I even took a pass on that too. So <laughs> like all characters, I was just like, nope, I think we can go further. So yeah, I love doing the mystery machine. It was great. So here's the rest of the gang got the same thing and I'll give you sort of truncated versions of each one of them. Um, we did in-house exploration, that one on the left there with her wearing, um, uh, you know, uh, pants. Cause we had a note, it was like, you know, she's solving crimes and running around, maybe not in a dress. What if we put her in something, you know, more suited for action? 
So we said, what about a purple leather jacket and purple pants, like, uh, you know, um, what are those pants called, Allison? Uh, capri pants. Capri. Um, uh, and, but, but it was all, yeah, <laughs> it was keeping the ratio, the, the, just the little bit of green to represent where the scarf was, the right amounts there. Uh, we tried another kind of dress where it was just a little ringer and the collar was the, was the green. We tried no headband. But after we had Jamie come in, she was like, yes, headband. Bring back headband. And she gave <laughs> the style of this dress yeah. that's really close to Daphne's dress, um, but just a little more contemporary. Uh, we were looking at stars too. We were looking at people like Taylor Swift and how they dressed and things like that. So, and then, and then sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes you need to know what your own limitations are and what your own expertise is and, and call in an expert witness, you know, like a, like a trial. You want to call in an expert witness. And Jamie was super huge in this because she, this is, this is her, this is her area of expertise. So if she said, put a belt on it, because you know that can match the color of the original then it was like okay we'll do that yeah and and when you get the final results i mean look at it you don't have any doubts who that is you really don't miss the scarf you get the same amount of that color accent and put her in the hands of really talented people and she was just so adorable in this movie she has such great moments in this movie i, I, I kind of like the emma peel daphne that you showed <laughs> 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 Pretty good, though. So Velma got I have a question from Mark as well about the fact that the, the rest of the crew, um, Velma and Daphne and Fred, look a little more realistic than Shaggy does. Yeah. And that was, that's part of the original drawings, yeah, too. Yeah, totally. But uh, they, it was noticed that they are, they are a more realistic Oh, style. no. The, I, I said... Like I, I said earlier, there are so many conflicting animation styles inside this movie all happening at once. And there was a little bit of like, how much, cause we had to actually introduce a little extra caricature into them, even though they're more realistic than Shaggy is. Um, we had to bring, we had to like find some common ground. So like, if you notice like, ear shapes and, and eye shapes. And, and we started like finding some common ground that we could do with people. Cause we were going to have Fred and Dick Dastardly in the same movie. And, mm -hmm. you know, stylistically, they don't belong in this, no, in no. the same universe at all. And, and Captain Caveman, right. Which is such a cheat of a 2d character. What were we going to do with him? So there is, yeah, we're, there's still different levels of uh, realism versus abstraction. Um, and I, I personally was like, I'll, that did keep me up at night. Like that did make me go, what is that gonna look like when we see all of these conflicting things? Like those things made, that it made me nervous. But I kind of went back to other movies. Like I remember, I, you know, having the art of, Big Hero 6 and looking at them and I'm like, there's a commonality there, but but there's also a freedom there where like characters, if some character's more cartoony, because there there is like a shaggy character in that type of character in that movie, mm -hmm. he's kind of different mm -hmm. than than some of the other characters. So I started relaxing a little bit and going, I've seen this work in other movies very well and i think it's going to work here and also i think we embraced it a little bit we embraced the difference of some of them i mean i've not only is there a little bit of difference in realism i don't even think gravity affects fred and shaggy the same way like yeah the actual laws of physics don't apply to them either so we just went, That's it's a mashup, let's, let's write. Anyway, I mean, like Shaggy and Scooby, if anyone was going to do the, 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 the floating take and then zip, you, you never saw that. Right. And if Fred did that, it'd be kind of weird. Yeah. yeah. That, that, so, that was, that was kind of what convinced me that we, we could get away with it was again, going back to the originals and looking and, and Fred and Velma and Daphne were played pretty naturalistic. And, but then and Scooby I'll be honest, one of the, and this is another thing too, and this is based on my own experience. There's not a 
preciousness to the Hanna-Barbera characters like there is to the Looney Tune characters, right? If you're making a Bugs Bunny short, which Bugs Bunny is it? And who are you gonna honor? Is it more of a Chuck Bugs or a Clampet Bugs or a McKimson Bugs or a Freeling Bugs? Like, and you could, you could write a doctoral thesis on every one of those things and everything is hmm. precious, like, right? I would read that, by the way. I wanna read that thesis. Somebody <laughs> but like Hanna-Barbera was like, yeah, let's try it. Like they, they made Laugh Olympics and put Yogi Bear and, and, they didn't care about this stuff and they really didn't. They would just try stuff and they weren't precious about things. So we're like, let's not be more precious than, than they were, you know, let's honor it, but let's not drive ourselves too crazy. I, I also think just an observation, somebody who wasn't on the crew by any stretch, sometimes the voices help sell the character in that, in that environment, especially Captain Caveman voice. That's so yeah. bad. I, I mean, I, I'm very, very happy with the cast on the movie. We did, there was, we did, you know, there was a decision made early on to go with, uh, to cast a different cast. And, in a, and that was done to make the movie different from the TV shows that are being made and try to make it its own thing. And, and, uh, and we, th that there was some purposeful separation there. Um, but I think Gina Rodriguez is a great film. Uh, you, we talked about Daphne, liking Daphne in the movie. And I'm, I mean, a ton of that is Amanda Seyfried. Like, so sweet. She's so yeah. good. You know, and Zac Efron as Fred, if it wasn't going to be Frank Welker, it was only going to be Zac Efron. And that's, that was the, my, from day one, like, Gina Rodriguez was Velma for three years before we recorded her, you know, like, we we yeah. got lucky with this cast. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she came to us and said, "I'm I'm obsessed with this character, and I feel like she's a role model. I want to play that role model." And it was, uh, you know, we it took a while for us to get to that that uh, that that part of the movie making process. But she was always with us. One of yeah, it didn't take us a while to to go. Okay, that's great. Yeah. we loved her. Pretty great. And I love I love that visually. We gave kind of we 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 brightened up Velma. Uh, in a way that, like, I hate to say it, if you look at the original model sheet, she was a little frog-ish. Like, she had a mouth that was a little bit too long. And and I, I think we made a version that, again, nobody would doubt who this character is, mm -hmm. but and, she's also super appealing. And, and there's is, a, yeah. I'm sorry to interject, but, there, oh. but to your point, there also is a 2D versus 3D thing that happened with the gang more than happened with other characters, oh, yeah. which is Velma looked weird in 3D. That super tradition of Velma is not an appealing 3D design. It just isn't. Fred, you know, trying to make a 3D version right of Fred, if you laid the drawing of Fred over our Fred model, his eyes and nose and ears, there, everything is in exactly the same place. It's just that there were four lines on that on that model sheet. So your brain fills in all the missing detail, but then when a computer shows it to you, you go, whoa, that isn't how I imagined it. So there was a lot of interpretation there where you're like, Fred and Velma and Daphne to some extent, the, their 3D versions took a little bit of work, especially especially Fred and Daphne because Tony, there, is, there isn't a lot of information there. Mm -hmm. we, we were, okay, so um, we were so lucky to have Ravi Kundi, um, who is an amazing sculptor and modeler um, in-house and part of my biz dev team. And we, we went in, it, we would go in and, and look at, at what he was building. And this is actually his model here in an early version of Fred where we were trying some things out with costumes. And he had blown oh. up model sheets profile and 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 straight on and they were to the to the line right exactly yeah. the but the minute we turned it there was that weirdness so the three of us in the room tony ravi and i we would go what will make again what tony was talking about what feels right as opposed to what actually is right because it didn't work in every angle and he was the toughest he was the toughest yeah. Um, all of Scooby and Shaggy and uh, most, a, a lot of things, uh, 
most things in the movie were modeled by Tom Jordan at Real Effects. But when it got to these three characters, we had to, we, we did need the finesse of, of being right on top of it all the time and just going, oh, try this, I'll try that. So and, this was an early version that we did where we tried again um, to use the same palette. I think we got, we went a little too far with the amount of blue and lost some white, but I did really like, I have to admit, uh, the t-shirt underneath was, um, if anyone can get what that is, you get a little, little bit, a hint of it. It actually is, says hike jelly stone underneath it because we wanted to give Fred a backstory that he's the jock of the group. He's an outdoorsy kind of guy. So we gave him a sportier jacket and the hiking shirt. Um, so we tried that version. And then this was Jamie's. Again, she said, no, bring it back. Let's bring it back to the original. Let's find something. If you want to go that sporty way, she's like, we could try like a letterman's jacket, but we could do a really contemporary version of that and get the same color accents um, and use like a ringer T to get that where the ascot would be. And there was a lot of questioning about the ascot, to ascot or not to ascot. <laughs> uh, you made a gag out of it in the movie. And, and well, yeah. we always knew we were going to find a way to honor the ascot. Um, <laughs> and but so, having made Mystery Incorporated, where we said, yes, Fred is going to wear it. Because for many years before that, they took the ascot off, Fred, right? because it is an odd thing, right? But so on Mystery Incorporated, we were like, no, we're bring, we, he has to wear it. But the only way to kind of make it look right was to style the entire wardrobe of everyone else on, in the universe that it made sense for a guy to, to wear an ascot. So I, on that show, what we did is we had every like catalog that we could get our hands on from 1968, 1969, and 1970. Every, every, every catalog and every costume that is in that entire series comes out of those catalogs somewhere, like was inspired by something we saw in a catalog. And by doing that research, we found in 1968 when, when Ewo designed this, because we had every catalog from every line that year, there was like a four, three or four month period where it was possible that a, a, a guy in his you know late teens, early 20s, um, which is kind of where our Fred lives, would actually wear that scarf ascot thing. There, there was only this tiny period in time that's this big, and that's when Ewo drew it. And, uh, and we could actually pinpoint it. It was kind of fun. Like, we did that historical research. But why doesn't Fred have a Nehru jacket as well? I, you know what? Plenty of characters had Nehru jackets in, uh, in Mystery Incorporated because of that. Like, but, but anyway, I'm digressing. But. No, but, but when we did our first, and when uh, the first looks of Fred got out, it was like, all of a sudden, the feedback was, where's the ascot? And mm -hmm. I, I added this recently to this talk because it was one of my favorite things Tony did was putting this on Instagram. And he was like, do you <laughs> think I would forget the ascot? And what was happening at that time was a, an idea got spitballed and started. I started hearing rumors around about a scene where we would get the ascot in. And when I found out where it was gonna be, I immediately jumped onto my computer and did a quick color key and sent this <laughs> <laughs> I need to see this. I need to see this very badly. And because of that, and uh, uh, um, we actually did get to see it. And it's my favorite moment in the movie. So. Yeah, me too. It is. It's my absolutely my favorite moment. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so um, we went from, uh, we started with Ewo's stuff, 1969, and, oh, it still says Spark on this, so this should say a CFO up there. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, and this is where we ended up uh, in 2020. There you go. So I think I, what it shows is really just, I, I feel like it is three people and many more people, many, many, many more people that had a love for this uh, group of characters and did everything we could to 
pay honored, uh, 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 pay our respects to them, uh, um, and also create something new and find a way to make it all work in, in 3D. So that brings us here. Yeah. Um, do you want to set up this clip? I sound like Johnny Carson. <laughs> oh, I, I, I was like, which clip is this? Um, so uh, this actually happened very late in the movie. Um, and it, it wound up being uh, a favorite of the crew. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it turned out to be a favorite of a lot of the fans, which is we knew we were going to have this montage between this, this section of the movie where the, the gang are kids and where we catch up with them 10 years later and they're that in their early 20s. Um, and we tried a million different things, but someone had a point, and I don't, which was, we, we are, there already is a montage that everyone knows and loves. And is there some way we could use it, kind of repurpose for it for the movie to kind of show this transition from, from kids to grown ups? So we added that we actually did this very late in the movie. Um, and yeah, it might have been the last sequence or one of the last was, sequences. And everyone was like working at overtime and at night on their own to pull it off. Congratulations, everyone. We just proved this house wasn't haunted and busted a perk. And even better, we got our candy back. Not bad for a bunch of kids. Maybe we should do this again. I like it. I'm in. What do you say, guys? We're in. in. I mean, like, how many scary monsters could there be? So that was like a very passionate clip that happened very from every animator, every modeler, every rigger, um, lighting it, creating sets that were that were only going to be used for you know half a second in the whole movie. Like, and also uh, the the theme song uh, being done by Best Coast, uh, who did it in like what else in like three days as yeah. they were starting a tour. So, yeah, like we saw them on a on a Friday night, and by by Monday morning we had the we yeah, had the <laughs> and that Bob and Bethany were super into it and did it really did a great job and did it really quickly. It was it was very that was a, an exciting way to kind of end our experience making this movie. Yeah, it was, it was like a love letter tribute to the original. To, and to um, also that is uh, um, oh Don Messick, the the sp spooky space kook. As because this is a CIFA and everyone will, will under, appreciate this. Um, I've been told for 25 years at, at Warner Brothers that, um, that the master tapes, the, the, the master recordings of some of these, of these Hanna-Barbera shows, in particular, uh, Muttley's Laugh, um, that, that they're gone and that they're, no one ever saved anything and everything was gone. And um, and I said, could we look one more time? Um, and Randy, and Randy Bull actually f f tracked it down through the archives department, which many people have done in the past and were never successful. But somehow they realized that some of the 70s Hanna-Barbera shows were in deep storage. And deep storage for Warner Brothers means a salt mine in... <laughs> Kansas. Oh, Iron Mountain. Uh, yeah, probably an so Iron Mountain. Someone had to fly to Kansas, go two <laughs> miles under the earth, <laughs> to find these tracks. And when we found the original Muttley Laugh, because that's Billy West in the movie, 
doing Muttley's speaking voice, but that is Don Messick doing Muttley's laugh from a, an actual clean recording. Yeah. And when we found that, we found the Space Kooks actual laugh and put that in this. So that's the first le legitimate use of that laugh in 50 years. So. You know, I, um, Michael, if you can unshare your screen so we can get everybody else back up on screen. There you go. We're all back. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, I also noticed you were using some of the Hanna-Barbera sound effects. Very much yeah. that. Flintstone bowling. Yeah. No, that was a, that, and in feature animation, you don't really go with those kind of stylized sound effects, but it is so much a part of the, of, yeah. of, of the Hanna-Barbera world that you had to find the right balance of, of, of traditional Hanna-Barbera sound effects and feature quality sound effects all mixing together. Um, it was exciting on the soundstage at the end to watch how like the, even the action sequences were so, uh, just the punctuation by the Hanna-Barbera sound effects gave this movie such a signature sound, which uh, is very unique. I did want to, I did want, there was a couple more questions I wanted to get to. One's by Ryan Shore. Uh, now Ryan has actually worked for you guys before. Uh, and, and I'll read, I'll read the question. Uh, Scooby, the film was fantastic. Huge congratulations. Scooby-Doo is such wonderful music tradition going back to origins in the late 60s and continuing through generations today. I've had the honor of scoring two, two animated Scooby-Doo films myself. And I know the music style has always been a part of the conversation. How did you go about finding your creative direction for the score? Um, that's a great story. And um, it really comes down to Tom Holkenborg, who is our composer. Of the, the, the meeting, Bill and, and Michael and I, we all gelled so quickly. Like, I feel like mm -hmm. Michael and I had lunch. By the end of that lunch, I went, oh, I, I feel like I've known this guy my whole life. We are exactly on the same page. The same thing with Bill. We immediately had a shorthand. We immediately spoke the same language. Um, and I and and I had that same experience with Tom, where I was like, I had something in my head. We had done a we had done so many different versions of trying to find a temp version of that, and I and I could never it never sounded like what was in my head. And within talking to Tom for at twenty minutes, I'm like, this is the guy. This guy this guy could do it, um, and I think he did an amazing job, just like. Um, just like Bill Dean with sound effects or, you know, of blending modern big, big screen movie with Hanna-Barbera. And um, just like we have many animation styles in a movie, we have many musical styles. And we actually, instead of going with just themes for the characters, we kind of go to different, almost musical styles for each character. There is a lot of things going on. There's a lot of musical gymnastics. And one of the things we also did was go back to the original score. So when they're kids and and they start going into the haunted house there, when you know on their first mystery, their first investigation, and those those traditional cues start coming up. I mean, I, the first time I heard that, honestly, I had goosebumps because I'm like, mm -hmm. this is it, right? The music is telling you, this is it. So. Um, I, I was I was really happy, very happy with the way the music worked out for the movie. Following up on that one, Melissa Axel asks, um, uh, how did you choose the songs, the existing songs? You talked a little bit about that. And was anything, any new songs written specifically for the? Yeah, the yeah, a whole bunch of new songs. Um, and they and there's a soundtrack album that's doing pretty well. Uh, that uh, summer feeling song um, wound up being really popular. Um, Allison, you remember who that is? Lennon Stella? Yeah, Lennon Stella and Charlie Puth. And Charlie Puth, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh no, that was good. And um and Tom Pett and Kane Brown have a song. Yeah. Uh, but then also I thought, you know, the, the picking of the of the actual needle drops that we have, um, and so uh were, it was pretty important because we really were trying to do a time and a place like the opening of California Love really was about let's establish that this is LA 2000. <laughs> and, and, uh, 
and this, and he's a he's a beach kid so like there's just so many elements that went into like really choosing music that that was appropriate and, and that's gabe hilfer we worked with G gabe hilfer was our music supervisor we worked uh and and i and we worked with gabe for a long time because sometimes that stuff's done at the end of a movie but gabe was a big part of help of picking those songs and also like like Allison said, those songs are creating emotion and tone and feeling. And you know, to be honest, California Love is not the cheapest song we could have we could have licensed, um, but we couldn't beat it. And I'm yep. like, this is the this is the Los Angeles national anthem. You can, yeah, and we could beat it. Great, and there's there just was no beating it. So had to go I, back like, to the I wanted it to be the first thing you heard in the movie. <laughs> well, Craig? I, I, I have one more and then we're going to we'll probably wrap it up. This is from Lorenzo, the Geek Authority. He said, <laughs> I love the film. Awesome job. Congratulations. Watched it twice. I'm eager, eager to review it soon, so you're probably going to hear from this young fellow. He <laughs> <laughs> said, I watched all the behind the scenes content and saw all the deleted scenes. And I know there were a lot, including a Machu Picchu sequence. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, uh, how did you determine story-wise to use the wandering chase versus the fi uh, versus the loneliness of young Shaggy by having his parents taking a young Shaggy to get an abandoned puppy? I know that must have been, I didn't see that particular scene. Yeah, so. I mean, there's so many iterations and so many things and, and there's so many, you know, like there are a lot of opinions going on and you're trying to balance all these things and make the right decision. Um, there, I like the, the idea of, of him adopting, of, uh, little Sh Shaggy adopting, um, puppy Scooby, but there was also like production thing, you know, production reasons behind a lot of decisions. Uh, it's interesting cause, uh, the, I actually posted something on Instagram today about that Machu Picchu scene. The Machu Picchu scene you bring up was really laying the groundwork for Dastardly and what he was doing and the mystery behind those skulls. And I do feel like it now in hindsight, if there was any scene I could put back in the movie, it would be that scene. Like mm -hmm. I feel like it's the good. Movie suffered by not having that scene. Yeah. But, 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 but further to also that the, the meeting on the beach, one of, I think the reasons that kind of came up was, they are equals they are it's they're like it's like a it's like a meet cute in in a rom-com and so i think a reason that we went to the kind of the chase on the beach was because we wanted them to be both in need they you know a stray dog and a lonely kid meet and then that, that's what makes them whole so that it, and it kind of plays into the ending so it just felt like as we iterated that was the version that that was and how do we do that in a fun way? How do we do this me cute right at the head of the movie in a bright, colorful, fun way? Because the the puppy adoption scenes always kind of came out kind of somber, mm -hmm. and also they were not placed in the movie where the yeah. where the where the Venice Beach scene is. Yeah, um, originally. Yeah, and uh, Venice Beach too is uh, It was important. Um, it was important to me that we kind of create a realistic and believable version of Southern California because we were going to go on a fantastical adventure. So I just wanted there to be some basis in where it felt like, oh yeah, that's Venice Beach, that's Santa Monica, that's, I, I feel like I know where these streets are. Um, and I, I think it, it added something and it really added a, a feeling of place. And I always felt that um, Scooby-Doo took place in California, even when I was a kid, I just felt like that's California, so. And there's a lot of Easter eggs in that. In yeah, that yeah, there's tons all over, over the place. There's, there's, there's Easter eggs to Messick, there's Easter eggs to, to Ewo, there's Easter eggs to, to Hannah and Barbara. Yeah, and Carlton. And, and, you know, like, uh, and, and, and it was really important, you know, that was, it was important to honor the Hanna-Barbera universe, but we were also, it, it was important to us to honor the, the creators and the, and the people that we owe, you know, our livelihoods to. Mm -hmm. Well, it all worked. Venice Beach worked, the Easter eggs all worked. There'll probably be stuff all over on the internet about the finding the various Easter eggs you guys put in there. The, 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 the transition, not only from how Scooby and Shaggy meet, to, but the transition of the look of the picture, 
all work. So congratulations to all you guys. This is where we wrap it up. We've, we've gone well over time. <laughs> and uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate the time you spent. I know that, that ASIFA does too. Uh, this uh, this uh, will be up on our ASIFA channel pretty soon too, and lots more people will watch it. Oh, so nice. thank you to, to Tony, to Bill, to Michael, and to Allison. Thank you very much. And we'll see ya. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Bye. Pleasure. <laughs>